to the SBAM daily briefing. It is Wednesday, April 8th. Um, we are in the 16th day of the executive order. Uh, stay home, stay safe. Um, I'd like to welcome you. Um, just as a reminder, if you're, if you're uh, listening today, uh, watching on Facebook uh, or on Zoom, if you wouldn't mind checking in, uh, it would be good so we kind of know who's, uh, who's a part of this. I said yesterday that I think what's really happened is we've, we've kind of created a community. And I know there are a lot of people who are uh, talking to each other and finding some comfort in, uh, in having another business owner to talk with. Uh, and we certainly want to continue to give you uh, that, that opportunity. So check in if you would. We appreciate it. Um, today, we have a special guest. Um, uh, uh, Brian is going to introduce him. Uh, you're going to see something a little different from Brian today. And uh, again, for those of you who've been uh, watching regularly, you know that uh, Brian's home office is in his car, um, but uh, with a little different twist today, Brian. Yeah, it, I, so every day I do this from my car because I got to drive closer to town to get a good enough signal. Um, but then I read an article that it's good for you to dress like you're going to work every once in a while. So uh, today I've got, well, you can't see it, but I got pants on and everything. And uh, so I wanted to, um, you know, just kind of I don't, pretend like pretend like we're back in the in the real world. So I got I got all spiffed up. I got it tight though. It's, I don't think that this uh, I don't think that this stay home order diet is uh, going to be good for my wardrobe. But, uh, but I, you know, I look forward to this every day. We spend some time with, with hundreds, and by the end of the day, thousands of, of uh, small business owners and bringing to you important information. Uh, today, it's a little different. We've been talking a lot about compliance, a lot about things that have already happened, a lot about things that we know are going to happen. Uh, but we've invited Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky on today so that we can, we can talk about a whole host of things. Now, he's a business owner himself. And, uh, and so you're not going to find another public official that understands in, in such a, uh, a very detailed and personal way what you guys are going through. Uh, but he's also a policymaker at the, at the highest levels of state government. And, uh, and he's starting the, the work kind of framing the, this question about, about how we ease back into going back to work. And we just think this is an important thing for uh, for our members to start think to know that our leaders, some of our leaders anyway, are thinking uh, about this and already working toward those goals. So with that, uh, Mike, why don't you just take a few uh, few minutes just to to talk a little bit about uh, yourself, a little bit of introduction in your business, and uh, and then uh, some of the things that you're thinking about in terms of this restart of our economy. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that invitation. It's a privilege to serve all of you and thank you for being the job creators across Michigan. Now, my business called Orbit Forms in Jackson, this is our 32nd year. You know, it's a small business. We have 125 employees. They're all skilled but me. And we do engineering and design and build of uh, very special machines, uh, tooling, et cetera. Uh, but I'm proud to also tell you that two Sundays ago, I gathered the team together and I said, we're gonna, I made us a couple sketches on a piece of paper, literally hand sketches. I said, we're gonna go build these sanitizers uh, because we, I knew that we, we had a, a, play, a way to place ourselves into the mix to provide some help. And so we delivered today our first dozen uh, mask sanitizers that are based on UVC light. Uh, we went to Henry Ford, McLaren, and a few other places that I won't reveal. Uh, police stations and fire stations are really adopting it. But we're glad to be able to do that. But my, that's my for-profit job, but my non-profit job is I'm privileged to serve as a Senate Majority Leader and, uh, and rep represent you and everybody across the state. I believe it's time we make this transition. I've been very supportive, and I think everybody else has, about the, the uh, necessary actions that our governor has taken to arrest the spread of this disease. But we cannot sacrifice our economy for a disease that we know is gonna be here for a while. And we need, all we need to do is be smart about it. And so what we're advocating for starting yesterday was a transition from the definition of essential, which was problematic in the beginning at best, to a notion of, uh, that started with my question, why do we assume that work is safer than home? Which then leads you to the ask, the, ask the question, how do we make work as safe as home? And it led us to a conclusion that it's, we can do so, but it takes two really important partners. One partner is the business community and those that run their operations and their commitment to discipline 
and setting up pro policies and protocols that actually indeed establish safe workplaces. But the other element, which is equally important, is that individuals across the state, every single one of us, have to embrace with full-throated support this what I call the new big three, and that's hygiene, distancing, and masks. If we do those two things together, and, and um, systematically and prudently and logically establish solid practices within our businesses to protect our employees, protect the customers, and protect the public, then we can chew, walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, I'm not going to second guess our governor because you know she's got a whole list of urgent issues that she has to pay attention to. I view this as a parallel effort to help give her some help for us to get out of this thing uh, and get out of it without losing everything. Yeah, well, Senator. Uh, that, yeah, that, that overview. Thank you so much, uh, Senator. That um, I, I think that's really going to ring true to our um, to our members is because they're thinking a lot about their workforce and their in in the public that they serve and their customers. Um, that's that is their very survival is the is the best and good interest of all of those stakeholders. And um, so I, maybe you could even so you're 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 operating now um, making these sanitizers in your business. Could you maybe talk a little bit about the types of steps that you've taken in your operations to do the sorts of things that you're talking about in a broader uh, policy scale? Sure. First of all, everybody that can work from home because we have a lot of salespeople and we have a lot of engineers and they basically do their work at workstations. And so all those folks are working at home. And I got to tell you, anecdotally, I actually think our productivity has gone up. And I uh, can't assign a reason for that yet, other than I think people like it when you trust them, you know. And then we have, uh, we, we um, reduced our workforce in the shop and in, in the manufacturing arena by about a third because I couldn't really justify a third of them. They, were, they weren't really working on projects uh, that were essential, but the rest are either working on with customers that are deemed essential or these other products that we're trying to build to uh, support. The other things we've done internally is that we're testing uh, uh, with, with the queries of questions every day. And did you do this? Have you been here? Who have you been in contact with? Just so people have it on their minds and they're aware of it. We have not embraced uh, temperature testing yet. We've discovered that that has a pretty wide variability to it. But if anybody has a temperature above 102, or excuse me, 101, we ask them to go home. If there does, if there is a person, we haven't had any yet, knock on wood, uh, within the factory that comes down with the virus, then we have protocols set up for that as well. And in all cases, we leave it up to the employee. If, they, if they're if they worried about coming to work because of safety, uh, we do not hold that against them. And we said, okay, you, you can go off. It's not inde indefinite. And uh, you know we'll be we'll be crossing that bridge later when you know when we have uh, more data and more testimony and more clarity of what's actually happening. Does that help, Brian? Yeah, that was that was outstanding, Rob. Yeah, Senator, um, I, I I so appreciate your voice in this whole uh, conversation. I think the difficult part, you know, we're we're hearing every day of companies who will not make it another day, and 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 what we know in the economy is. Some companies simply will not be able to recover from this. They're not going to make it back. And as long and the longer it goes, the worse that is. So uh, we're, we're glad, but but it seemed like it was tone deaf to be starting a conversation about how do we get back to work when you know. Uh, so I appreciate you taking the, the the leadership position that you have and and saying that we can do both at the same time on parallel paths. You've been fairly specific about how you want to organize around this. Will you talk a little bit about um, how, how you see it going forward and maybe even, you know, I, I almost feel like there's, there are two voices here that are, that, that any leader has got to listen to the public health voice and the economic voice. And so in some ways you're, you're sort of trying to provide that balance. Um, how do you see it going forward? Let me first, I'm kind of a visual guy. So let me first start with the, uh, the description of a spectrum. Think about a horizontal line of spectrum on the far left you have businesses, I'll just call, I'll just name one, a sole proprietor lawn care specialist, the guy that run, mows my yard. He shows up on routine. Uh, we don't interact. He's, uh, he uh, works by himself. He travels by himself. He sends me a bill. I send him payment. His hurdles for meeting safe workplace requirements and safe personal behaviors are not that difficult to achieve. 
and he should be released to work, he or she should be released to work today. On the other end of the spectrum, if the four of us on this call uh, were assigned the job to set up a con rock concert at Ford Field, the levels of, of precaution and safety are way too far uh, uh, away from us being able to achieve those. That's not gonna be practical today. So in between those two extremes on the spectrum are all of your clients, virtually all of them. Some of them are toward the simple end, some of them are toward the very complex end. And so the levels of uh, regulations, policies, protocols, and complexity of those are all based on A, things like how many people do you have working? Um, how closely are, do they have to work together? What is your, how, are, how, how much, how, how well can you manage public access? How well can you manage customer access? All those things. And those are protocols and principles that a business can manage. This is why I challenge the notion that why do we assume it's safer at home than work? Because frankly, if work has specific conditions in which you got to meet, you're not going to get lazy on them if you want to stay working. At home, I'm not sure we're all as disciplined as we necessarily need to be. And so that's a, to me, is a legitimate challenge. But I can't over overemphasize enough, Rob, that this is a partnership between business and personal behaviors. To your question about uh, medical uh, professionals and their input, you know, they're gonna always tend to try to achieve zero risk. Right. They have to, that's part of their job, that's part of their training, nobody, sh we want them to do that. But the reality is this, if we try to achieve zero risk, particularly in this environment, we will end up with one guaranteed outcome, zero freedoms and zero liberties. And so uh, we're gonna have uh, medical professionals review what our recommendations are going to be to the governor. We'll try our best to, uh, to adopt them but we're going to make some judgments because, again, we can't achieve, nor should we even try to try to strive for achieving a zero risk because we're going to fail at it. So I, I, yesterday, the, um, the, the announcement that you made uh, with respect to, to who's going to be working on this, and, um, and maybe you could give us a little insight into that because it, it looks like a very inclusive approach. Uh, to me, one that is uh, bending over backward to avoid uh, any partisan aspect of it. Maybe share that with our audience. Absolutely, Brian. I'm glad you observed that and it was purposeful. Senator Horn is leading it because he's got a, such a passion for economic development and protecting our commerce and our businesses. We have Kurt Vanderwall, who's also our health policy chair, to add that flavor to it. And then we have Wayne Schmidt, who represents the northern part of the state and those that sometimes don't have a loud voice. Then we got Jeremy Moss, uh, Sylvia Santana and uh, Stephanie Chang, all three strong, strong senators, very pragmatic, very logical, their own unique constituents, constituencies. And I was on a call with them early this morning and, and everybody had a chance to kind of express their, their uh, viewpoints of the charge of the, of the uh, work group. And I was amazed at how aligned everybody was and how passionate everybody was. Uh, there'll be some differences, that's okay, but this cannot, be partisan, uh, even though my governor, frankly, takes it that direction too far too often. And, and so since you didn't overtly say it, three of those names are Republicans and three of those names are Democrats. And um, since I've served in the legislative process myself, I just want to point out that when it comes to establishing committees, normally the party in charge, in this case, Republicans in the Senate have the majority Normally, a committee like this would have more Republicans than Democrats, and yet you have made it 50-50. Right. And, uh, and so that's, that's, that, that does really speak to the, uh, the commitment that you have to make sure that, uh, that there can't be any kind of partisan bent to it. And, and then beyond that, the Republicans that are on the committee are Republicans that have strong reputations for working across the aisle and getting a, along well with other people, with other uh, people from all over the state, and including the governor. So uh, to, to me, it looks like uh, the, the perfect mix of people to, uh, to take this out of the political debate and argument and to just get down to what are the best answers for our people. I'm a big believer in the, using the, um, the tool call to actions. And so if you allow me for just a moment, I'd like to insert a call to action in here right now. We can continue the conversation, but I'd like all your members who are willing to do so to contact Senator Horn, Vanderwall, Schmidt, Chang, Moss, and Santana and encourage them and tell them that the pressure's on. 
you, it's okay. Tell them that the pressure's on. We got to move. But if they hear that kind of encouragement across the board, it would be amazing support for them and a great inspiration. Well, we can do that. We can do that, Mike. And I, I think um, including making sure we put those uh, six senators' names up on our website so people will know who they are and how to get in touch with them. Um, so, hey, we really appreciate, again, your leadership, uh, your, your uh, willingness to come on and talk about this a little bit. I think a lot of people are going to be really glad to hear uh, what you were just talking about. I think there are a lot of people who think, you know, the truth is most public health officials have no business background and couldn't begin to describe the spectrum that you, you laid out from companies that are really, really low risk to high risk propositions that that not all businesses are the same. And the, um, the answer probably lies in understanding business way better than I think some of our public health officials do. So it's good to have you where you are. It's good to have you willing to, to step into this uh, conversation and to lead in the conversation about how we come back. All of our members need to know when and how we're getting out of this. And what, um, I'm, trying to, and what I'm trying to achieve, Rob, is not is to enable them to be able to determine on them for themselves when, not wait for some magic, undefinable, unachievable, zero risk date. Yeah. Let's just lay it out, let's get smart. Live, love, and work smartly. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. We're gonna to move on to a couple of other topics because they're uh, ones that we're getting lots and lots of questions about, so thank you. Thank you. I do want to point out that I'm providing a little balance. Uh, to, Senator has his Michigan hat on. I just want to make sure that uh, balance is important for all of us, right? <laughs> hey, Brian, let's talk about um, uh, unemployment insurance because this question continues to come up. and I think we have a little more um, clarity around it. Um, the, the question of 1099 independent contractor sole proprietors eligibility for unemployment and uh, what maybe they should be doing and thinking right now. The CARES Act made this change on March 29th to say that people that previously were not eligible for unemployment, such as 1099 contractors and sole proprietors and business owners that did not treat themselves like employees. In other words, didn't pay unemployment taxes on, on, or assessments on your, on your own salary. So those categories, previously were not included in the in the state um, in the state unemployment system the cares act that president trump signed at the end of last month expanded eligibility to include those classifications however his signature on that bill does not just make it happen so what happened had to happen after that is the uh, the department of labor had to send guidance had to send rules to the state about how that eligibility worked. You know, to say I'm self-employed, but how do you prove it? Like what, what's required? Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the eligibility um, thresholds that have to be met? So the Federal Department of Labor had to write those rules. They were delivered to the state, to all states on Monday. So as of Monday, the state has the rules, but you still can't file if you're looking to until they take those rules and then program them into the system. Thus far, as of today, they're not willing to say how long that will take them. And now I'm talking about the state. The state unemployment agency is unwilling to say that on this date, our system will be ready to accept those applications. So if you are self-employed or a 1099 contractor, and you submitted through the system, you probably got a denial. If you went on today and submitted through the system, you'll probably receive a denial. And that's because the system is still, the system hasn't been changed from to what it was before or from what it was before. So um, we are hopeful that they will have this worked out in the next week, but they're not willing to say that. And, um, and so we're, our recommendation is just if you want to file, if you're planning on filing, check the, their website every day. They will announce it when it when it goes live, and uh, you're not missing out on anything by 
by filing ahead of their announcement because their system isn't built to accept your application now. So I know it's, fr it's frustrating for a lot of people and the system's been down. It was never meant to handle the type of uh, volume that it's receiving today. Um, I've heard that there's about a million people now on unemployment. And even though our unemployment system was probably the most robustly built system in the country coming out of 2009, um, it still was nowhere near um, the, the type of traffic and volume that's been handled, that it's been expected to handle uh, at this point. You know, one of the things we've been hearing is just the, the um, uh, you, you can call and you can't get through at all. Do you, do you have any sense of, of um, I, I think we've heard that they are adding staff, um, that they're really working hard to try to, to um, address this backlog. Yeah, and, um, and I believe that in terms of uh, the total volume, there's so many people on unemployment now that um, it's probably on the backside of this, um, of this volume curve until they open it up for contractors and sole, sole proprietors. I think that's gonna create another wave. But they went from 150 staff to 300 staff members. And they also implemented mandatory overtime rules, 23 hours of overtime every week. So um, it's three hours more per day per person and an eight hour shift on the weekend. So, um, so in the, the overall, they've taken a lot of steps to try and handle the volume, and it, but it's still, they could add a thousand staff and it's still not gonna be smooth um, because we, we, we're talking a million people have gone through or somewhere near a million people have gone through the system now. So um, it's, uh, but the other thing I wanted to bring up is uh, if you wanna start planning, like when they change the system and then you can apply um, how much will you get? And there's kind of a rule of thumb here. Take whatever this you qualified before. So for a sole proprietor or an, a, uh, an independent contractor, what you qualified before was zero. Add $600, a federal change is $600 over and above whatever you would have qualified for before. So $600 per week is what a sole proprietor or an independent contractor or a, um, or a self-employed person that did not treat themselves as an employee, W-2 wage employee of their business, $600, there's no, there's no formula to it. It's just six, flat $600. For your employees, it's different. Your employees were on those W-2 wages. They qualified for something before and whatever they qualified for before, it's that plus $600. The top was $362. That was the most you could get out of state unemployment system. So that exact employee, when this all gets reprogrammed and kicks in, they will, instead of 362, they'll receive $962 a week. So um, we, we, we actually have a fair no, uh, number of, of independent contractors and sole proprietors where they're looking at their options and saying, well, $2,400 a month, $600 a week, um, that's not that different than if I would have, if I go after one of these paycheck protection program loans. So I might as well just file for unemployment. You know, that, that's the sort of thing that people really do need to just do the math. You know, you, you know for the paycheck protection program, you take, you, you get 250% of your average monthly payroll to be spent in an eight week period. Um, is that better or worse than just filing for unemployment. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind that you do have options here. So you just mentioned the Paycheck Protection Program. Let's do a little update on that. Um, we've heard, uh, I think we heard earlier today that um, Huntington Bank uh, tapped the brakes. Um, they're temporarily stopping taking applications. We're hearing stories of people who've gotten funding. Uh, for the, We continue to hear stories of people whose uh, financial institution isn't even yet taking applications. What, what are you hearing? Thankfully, we are hearing more and more. Yesterday I asked for people to email us, hey, have you received an, an approval? Uh, let us know uh, so we can, we can let the higher uh, policymakers know if this is working or not working or things are moving in the right direction. I'm confident in saying that, that many more are processing applications today 
compared to yesterday, which was more than the day before. Um, several of the really big institutions are still saying they're about to come online, but not quite ready. Um, Huntington Bank did open uh, and take applications, I believe, over the weekend, or maybe even late Friday. Um, but the, uh, they're the number one SBA lender and, um, in the state, by far. So they are very experienced in SBA lending. But that was publicized so much, like all the newspapers and stuff that, you know, they, they kept on bringing up Huntington's name. So I think what happened to, there is everybody thought, wow, I better go through Huntington then. Um, I heard some rumors about the volume of, um, of applications that went through that one bank and it, it blew my mind. And so it, it didn't surprise me when I saw the headline that Huntington said, we're full for now. We've got to process some of these before we can let any more come in. Um, so uh, in Crane's Detroit business, they said it was, um, they had about, I think, $4 billion in requests just at one bank. And they had processed through about $2 billion worth. Um, Huntington is a very experienced um, SBA lender. They will work through that backlog and they will open it back up. So if you're a Huntington customer, I don't want you to get too alarmed because on top of that, we are getting more and more confident by the day that, uh, that the, uh, the feds are going to add more money to this program. So um, the, the president is talking about it. The Senate is talking about it. In fact, I think they might even do a Senate vote tomorrow on 250 billion more. So um, that, that it, it takes a little bit of the heat off, but stay persistent because the bird in the hand, remember, bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. So um, it, it's getting better, but, but we're not there yet, Rob. And, you know, I think uh, that, well, a lot of the banks are saying we're going to deal with our customers first. I think it's important for people to understand that was the guidance they were given by the SBA and by Treasury is first take care of your own customers uh, before you begin taking on others. So our, our um, recommendation to our members is talk to your bank first is related to the fact that they're going to try to take their customers first. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we may be guilty of putting some pressure on small business owners to um, to get in line early. We talked, we used that line. We talked about uh, 350 billion won't go that far. Because of what Brian just said, that we're more and more confident every day there will be more money. Uh, I think you can relax a little bit if, if you are if you're not getting an answer from your bank, I, I hear the, the near desperation in some people's uh, comments, and I just want to encourage you to stay persistent, stay patient. Um, uh, I don't think we're going to run out of money uh, in, in anytime soon. So take a little bit of comfort that you can, you've got some breathing room. Um, I, let me just, as we wrap this up, there's a, a couple things coming up. Um, the the guidance given to the banks and to small businesses from the SBA was updated yesterday. So that got that um, frequently asked questions has been updated on our website. If you're still in the process of applying, you're still confused about things that might be a good resource for you to take a look at. It's the um, FAQs uh, as of April 7th, 2020. Also, uh, we are doing a webinar tomorrow about risks and recommendations of a remote workforce. Again, trying to get ahead a little bit of some of the issues that we begin to hear about uh, that are a result of having people work remotely and maybe not having had a technology plan that was prepared for that. Uh, so tune in tomorrow at noon for that webinar, risks and recommendations of a remote workforce. Thank you for, for uh, joining us today. Uh, hope that uh, continue to hope that these are helpful and that there is some um, some comfort in knowing that there are other small businesses uh, in the same place that you are, uh, and uh, that we're we're here for you and we're continuing to try to lead on behalf of small business uh, and serve uh, small businesses wherever you are. So have a great day. Remember, wash your hands and don't touch your face. Good luck, everybody. See you tomorrow.